All right, so here's a book that I've really, really enjoyed, uh, The Physical Basis of the Direction of Time by Zeh. Um, now, you can tell I really enjoyed it. I could tell I really enjoyed it because, you know, I bought it when I was a graduate student. And when I was a graduate student, I didn't have a lot of money for excess books and things like that. They do give you a stipend, right, as a graduate student in the uh, technical field usually. Um, but you don't have a lot of money. So what happened was I found a copy of this book in the library, in the science library at the University of Alabama. And probably an earlier edition. This is the fourth edition. It was an earlier edition, probably the second edition. And, you know, I checked it out three times. And if I check something out three times, I told myself, I'm just going to buy one of those books, <laughs> right? I'm going to buy the book. If I use it three times, I like it, right? It's good. It's a good book. So that's what we got here. This is a good book. All right, so now it's not in the fourth edition, now it's in the fifth edition. And it, I noticed while I was looking this up just a little bit earlier uh, that it was in the Frontiers Collection. This is not that book, obviously. This is another book from the Frontiers Collection. Uh, it just happens to be the only book in the Frontiers Collection I have at home. I keep most of them, the ones I have at work. Uh, I like them a lot, right? I like them a lot. But... Um, you know, I don't have enough time to read, unfortunately, so I don't have as many of them as I'd like. I'd like to be able to read one or two of them a year. Um, I'll probably end up rereading this one, in fact, because there's a little conference going on at the Perimeter Institute. I'm not sure if it's a conference. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a workshop. Um, I'll find out when I attend um, very, very soon. And that's just on one of the aspects of this is quantizing time is the name. Um, that that'll be fun um but i have to do a lot of work just to make sure that i understand what the guys are talking about because it's a very technical thing so it would be fun to actually understand them right so this book again it's a very nice book i like it a lot uh, it is a little more technical so some of those books in the frontiers collection are not so technical the one i showed you is fairly technical but some of the other ones that i like quite a lot like um Petrov's The Nature of Space and Time, I think that's what it's called. Um, it's not very technical at all. It's very easy to read. Uh, there's, I've got one on decoherence. Very easy to read. Maybe there are a few equations, but it's not that important, those equations, I think. I think it's a little more... I think the meat of that book is really conceptual. This book, you probably really need to be up on a lot of physics. Probably more physics than... I was up on when I read this in graduate school, and I probably read read it some in um, when I was in uh, New Orleans. And again, I think I'm probably going to do it again soon. I did notice that I had one of my little sheets here, right, where I'd started reading it again, um, but I only got a page into it, so or a page of notes on it. That's not a page. That's much more than a page. But it's still not that much. So I ran out of time last time I wanted to do this. And I can I think it was while I was here in Galveston because I remember talking to Randy about it in Physics Frontiers and saying, I probably ought to read that again. And I still and now I'm looking at it again. I just saw it on my shelf and I said, you know, I've got to read that again. Um so the way we usually do this is we'd like to find some contents. So here are some contents. And we just like to go through the contents and sort of talk about them. So, I mean, at the beginning, these first two um, chapters here, or the introduction plus the um, first chapter, we're really defining the thing that we're talking about. We're talking about the problem. What's the issue? And what's going on? And the issue is really that we have several things in physics that require there to be an arrow of time. That arrow of time that is says that there's something special about space or something special about time that differentiates it from space, even though, you know, if you sort of look at relativity, both special and general, there's some, really some sort of admixture to them. There's they're not really completely separate, but there's still something special about time. And so 
that that would be something that needs to be answered. What's really going on there, right? And we have these several things that, um, these several places that show that there is some sort of arrow of time, right? And basically, each of the chapters following that two, three, four, and or two, three, four, five, and six talk about one of those things and tries to say, is the reason for this, is the reason for the arrow of time in this particular spot? All right. And some places have a better uh, place, a better idea about what it should be, and others have a worse idea um, or a better claim to being the fundamental arrow of time. Because that's the important thing is, which one of these is the fundamental arrow, which is the real thing that makes time go forward step by step by step, right? I was listening to some previous uh, conferences on uh, PIRSA, previous Perimeter Institute conferences, listening to people talk. A workshop, actually, was this one. And the question here is, why can I stand in place? Why can my... Um, position in space stay the same, but I can't just stop myself in time. Right? Uh, another way it's put is you can move around in space anywhere you want, but in time you just end up going wherever time tells you to go. Right? The next instant is coming. You can't veer off in any way. I'm getting ideas right now, so I better stop because thinking about it's not going to help. So it's not going to help this. I'm going to have to stop and do other things. So the arrow of radiation is the first one. Uh, this is, you know, these retarded advanced forms of boundary value problems. Um, this is really one of these things where you look at um, certain things that happen, right? certain ways you can construct a system and you end up finding that only some of the solutions, mathematical solutions to the equations that you have have some reality in them, right? Um, and for example, if you were to throw a rock into a pond, right? If this rock goes into the pond, what happens after that waves ripple out, right? These waves ripple out from whatever this po point is in the center. Very, very bad, right? Or very good. I mean, that's what just what happens. But that's just this retarded solution. It's the retarded um, solution, retarded Green's function for the boundary value problem. The advanced Green's function doesn't exist. The advanced Green function would be if I throw the rock in, and as the water sees the rock coming towards it, the um, waves come towards it. Or possibly you could think the waves come towards this, the waves you know, just happen to come towards the center and maybe they eject a rock out or something like that. Either one of those, those aren't the things that happen, right? Those aren't the things that happen. So this is a definite thing you see, um, this sort of absorber theory of radiation, things like that. But it's not, it doesn't really have a great, um, a great place to claim to be the fundamental error of time. So this is something that's going to be explained, has to be explained by some of these other ones. And you can see right here that, um, you know, you've got some places here where it sounds like it's going to be thermodynamical or cosmological. So let's talk about the thermodynamical chapter three. Thermodynamical, that's pretty interesting too. So that's something that you're probably familiar with if you've had a lot of physics. Um, statistical mechanics says that basically you can go from what I'm going to call a low probability state, um, that's how you think about it, a state, a, a macro state that has a small number of ways to make it actually happen to a high probability macro state, a macro state where you have a large number of ways to make it happen. Uh, this is the law of increase in entropy. All right. So what we're saying is that a macro state, the thing that you observe, right? You and I were big 
large things with many, many um, atoms in it, in us. And the things we observe are things with lots and lots of atoms in them. And those things, and these things, and you, they're all um, statistical in nature in some way. So when I pull out this pen, there are a lot of different ways the atoms in this pen could be put together, right? And there are a lot of different ways it could be vibrating, right? And there are a lot of different ways that um, it could be interacting with the out with the air out here because the air itself has lots and lots of different things in it. And so because there are lots and lots of ways for it to do it, it has a fairly high entropy, right? It's fairly stable, actually. Uh, whereas if there were only a few, it would have a fairly low entropy. Um, so as life goes on, obviously, we know that we go from the low entropy to the high entropy state, low probability to high probability state. And we just look at those and we say, well, how does this actually um, work? And how do we get time out of that? Well, Boltzmann, this H theorem here, that's how we get time out of that. Boltzmann um, figured out that there was this property H that, that's always increasing and with time, and that seemed to be the reason for time, right? Um, so that's the reason why we have something like that going on. And there was only one little problem with that. That little problem was the H theorem says basically that entropy is going to increase with time or it's going to decrease with time. You don't know which. But if you make a particular um, assumption, it will increase with time. But that assumption, again, um, is something you just have to put in there and is something that's equivalent to saying this is the direction of the arrow of time. Right. So um, to use the H theorem to talk about the arrow of time basically means is basically circular. Right. Um, so that doesn't really work there. However, it might take some of the aspects of the arrow of time that we have. Right. You and I and the rest of the world. You know, as macroscopic objects interact with time in some way through this H theorem, right? So that, that might be the reason for our perception of time, how our perception of time works. Maybe, maybe, I'm not sure. You may be, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, so probably we have to go through something else. Radiation probably doesn't work. Thermodynamics might explain our perception of time, but doesn't really explain the arrow of time itself. Um, so we go to quantum mechanics now. Quantum mechanics is just like your standard, in some ways, quantum mechanics is just like your standard um, classical mechanics, your standard Newtonian mechanics, in that you have a time reversible theory. So a time reversible theory means that if I have something like this pen and it's moving here, I, you know, I've got some, um, it's moving in a direction, it's in a particular position, I can determine where it is, right? It comes over here. Time reversible theory says if I find this thing here going over there, I can actually pull everything back and figure out where it was. So that would be time reversible. An irreversible theory, one of the common ways to think about this is um, if you uh, drop an egg on the floor, right? You know, dropping an egg on the floor, the egg becomes a big messy mess, and there's no way for you to come back and put it back together again, right? That's that's one way to think about it. Again, if you pour some milk in your coffee or some cream, if that's the sort of thing that you put in your coffee, and you mix it up, then there's no way to unmix that coffee, right? You can't put the cream in. Um, mix it up and then decide decide a little bit later, okay, I, I really didn't want cream. Unmix it and scoop the um, cream off the top and uh, just like, you know, you did off the milk and um, let it go. So that time reversibility 
is, or that time irreversibility is, you know, it's sort of the thing that we want to find. It's one of the things we care about. Uh, our base rules, right, our base rules are time reversible, but we know that we have some sort of time thing that's moving forward in time, and we know there are things like that A that are time irreversible. Those are basically thermodynamical in nature, those irreversible things. Um, for quantum mechanics, the reversible thing is the wave function. That wave, the wave function in quantum mechanics is time reversible. So if you know the wave function at one time, you know how it's going to, you, can, you know, and you know all the interactions that are going on, you can figure out what's going to happen in the future, and you can figure out what had happened in the past exactly, all right, exactly. Um, but if you make a measurement, there's a problem, right? When you make a measurement, all of a sudden, this spread out, this spread out information in the wave function says you have something right here, and all the further evolution acts as if you made the measurement right there. That is, everything after you've made that measurement, right? Any wave function that has a probability that you would have made that particular measurement is a possible past at that measurement. And therefore, you lose the ability to put the um, pull the wave function back from that measurement. So that measurement is time irreversible. That is a possibility, right, for the um, reason for the direction of time. Although we don't really understand that, you know, we end up having all of these. Um, interpretations of quantum mechanics just because that uh, measurement process although in some sense it's understood it's not it's not that well understood that's why we have these different interpretations now, each of the interpretations uh, de Broglie Bohm the uh, Everett many worlds thing um, and so on um, coherent Coherent histories, those sorts of things, or decoherent histories, consistent histories. Um, those are all different ways to imagine what's happening when you make a measurement. All right, and depending on which one of those you have, depends on um, how that interacts with the arrow of time, or if it could, if it could even define the arrow of time or not. Right, so I don't think the many worlds hypothesis could give you the error of time, for example. Um, he talks about things here in ensembles versus entanglement. That's probably just Bell's theorem. Decoherence, which is uh, the fact that things are things interact with each other all the time. Right, so you already have some quantum um, ideas, right, sitting there in your Oops, talk too much. So you have some um, quantum interactions, not ideas, that are that are causing the wave function to constrain, that are creating, as everything just goes along, the uh, irreversible part of the uh, of time. So. Just those interactions are doing that. Now, again, does that really give us a meaningful time, right? Does that really tell us what time is, or does that assume there's already a time there? And, you know, I'm not particularly sure. Uh, I, I think that would still require you to have some idea of why there's a time in the first place. And, of course, theory comes down to the time arrow of various interpretations of quantum theory. Uh, that itself would be fun to sort of adapt into a um, video, wouldn't it? Um, assuming I had the time to do that. And then we have time arrow in sp space-time geometry. And that's going to talk about different things that happen with 
here you've got black holes, acceleration, expansion of the universe, geometrodynamics. That's um, it's an old idea from Wheeler. Um, I'm not I'm not sure if it, every time I read it, it means the same thing though. <laughs> um, maybe it does. I'm not completely sure that it does. Um, but we were already talking about that. There is in um, there is in relativity some idea about a time moving forwards and backwards and things like that. So that's um, what's going to happen here. You there's some stuff going on in black holes where you information loss and stuff like that. Um, you have expansion of the universe, right? So that's an, another interesting thing. So maybe that expansion of the universe has something to do with time. And maybe there's just an intrinsic time, right? And, you know, as far as the way we measure, you know, the space-time interval between different things, there is a difference between the time and the space. It's just that, you know, um we don't have a unique time, right? We have a time that is basically, you have the same idea about, you have the same view of what's happening with time, you yourself, no matter how fast you're going relative to another observer. So different paths give different times and to get to the same place, right? Um, which is kind of weird. And maybe there's something actually in that, right? But still it's, not really where we're going, I don't think, all the time. And then we have the time zero in quantum cosmology, uh, phase transitions of the vacuum, and quantum gravity and the quantization of time. Like I said, this is 6.2 where they're basically talking about the sort of things that uh, could happen to create time. So if you have some sort of quantization of space, Quantum gravity is basically quantizing in space. Um, well, you're also quantizing time because you're quantizing space-time. So how does that talk about the evolution of space and time um, on those sort of fundamental processes? I guess they're not technically fundamental processes. Um, but on those processes as space evolves in time. Uh, black holes in quantum cosmology, a lot of people who do that sort of stuff love black holes. The emergence of classical time. Now you get to a problem, right? If you have what's going on in quantum gravity, which would be some sort of random lattice, right? Some sort of lattice where there are many different possibilities for the lattice. You know, you've got something here, you've got something there, but the way the different um, paths between things are is not really complete you know you know those paths are different in different um eigenstates or eigenspaces i'm not sure what you call them um so you end up with different amount of different amounts of time to get to different places again but in a different way than you would in just regular relativity uh this quantized gravity uh, but, of course, then you have to get back to regular time, and they don't know how to do that. They're not really good with the quantization of time. I think they're even worse with going from quantized time to classical time. Um, and that classical time should get you to the relativistic, relativistic time or something like that. Uh, like a lot of things, this really has a good... Um, standing... This has a good standing for being the correct way to think about time, right? The only problem is, is there aren't any good theories. Well, maybe there are some good theories, but there aren't any um, really uh, viable experimental, experimentally testable theories for these things. Um, and most of the theories that we have sort of got stuck. Um, some more stuck than others, but... Uh, most of these theories are a little bit stuck somewhere in, you know, in their background. So we don't really know where this is going to show up. So you can look at loop quantum gravity or any other canonical, um, or 
quantum gravity. I don't really want to say the words because I'll get them backwards. Um, and string theory and so forth. Those things should give you some idea about what time is. That's one of the things they're going to do, is give you some idea about what time is. Um, and that's one of the things you can look at for that. So again, this is a pretty good book. And again, like I said, lots of fun math. So if you like math, it's all there. Um, different ideas about things. Um, although it's not really like a textbook, so you need to be able to understand this sort of stuff. But because it's really a, it really is a part of the argument a lot of times. Some of these things, we'll probably be talking about these later on. Okay, yeah, this is good here. Um, unfortunately, the, hopefully, unfortunately, these are not great figures because, you know, they were made a long, long time ago. Oh, this is good. I, 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 this is good. Um, I was making, I was actually going to make a video for some of these things, and I was a little confused on some of the directions of some th of some things because it seemed to me that they were going in the wrong direction but it looks like it's right here for this i'm not completely sure that this is the same um sort of diagram that i was making but it is sort of the idea uh, but you'll notice here this is basically where your singularity is so this is looking at schwartz shield solution it's looking at basically a stationary black hole the simplest black hole out in the world, you've got time opening up. This should be about 45 degrees here, actually. This is a little bit wide in this drawing. And as you get closer in, you know that this is your future light cone. And by that I mean, right, from you in um, three dimensions, basically. So it's really a three-dimensional cone or a four-dimensional cone with time as a center axis. Um, Anything in here is something that you can affect. So this is your future. This is a, trying to say this is your future. This should be at 45 degrees, sort of like these over here. Um, so these are the same things, these light cones. These are your futures. Um, as you get closer to your singularity here, your light cone compresses, right? And at the light cone, or at this or at the event horizon, not the singular, well, yeah, at the event horizon, it closes completely. You're, you have no future. Your future is pointing straight up that, um, straight along the time coordinate there. Uh, and then after you pass through the event horizon, you get this tilt here. And that tilt will compress and time is going inwards towards the singularity. All right, time is going towards the singularity. And that's what would happen to you if you went into a black hole. And then this is a Kuskal, or Kuskal, uh, uh, Zertes um, diagram. He only says Kuskal coordinates, so I hope it's Zertes. Um, I think it's something like that, S-Z-E-R-T-E-S, -E -E -S, I think. Um, and this is giving a um, picture of what's going on with that. This line here is R equals zero. This line is this line. So it's a weird way to um, draw this, right? It's a weird way to put these things together. So in between these things is the entire universe. <laughs> All right. And this is where you are. This is the event horizon of the black hole. Number two here is inside the black hole. So you can see things with the black hole in there. You can see things, um, how the uh, directions of your light cones uh, are going to be affected. So time is going to be affected, at least according to um, relativity. But maybe not. That's probably not the case. We'll soon on Physics Frontiers. I think next month Randy and I will talk about something and that'll probably actually end up in September or so. Um, the actual, it'll probably be done editing in September, but we're going to talk about some 
ways that maybe you don't end up with problems like that in black holes. Which is why I wanted to do the um, talk here on something like, something about um, Penrose diagrams and, di you know, the kinds of things, the kinds of representations that physicists use to explain uh, space-time, to think about space-time in total. All right, so anyways, uh, that's a bunch of things <laughs> just about my life that I talked about, I guess. Um, but this is The Physical Basis of the Direction of Time. Um, very nice book, a book that I, again, picked up several times from Springer uh, by Ze. Um, it's in its fifth edition now, so I'll put a link up for that, just like I have for the previous books. It's not too bad. The Frontier series aren't too bad. They're, they are designed for, you know, I mean, still technically competent people, but not for, um, you know, specialists. So this is a pretty good book. Uh, again, there's a lot of math, a lot of physics in it. It's going all over the place. You saw it went all over the place. It went from some basic mechanic stuff, well, some fairly complicated parts of what you call classical mechanics, to um, some extremely, you know, to statistical thermodynamics, to quantum mechanics, although I think the quantum mechanics is really just your average everyday quantum mechanics, not anything to do with quantum field theory, um, to relativity, to quantum gravity, right? There's a lot in this book, right? There's a lot for you to look at in this book. So um, on one hand, it's very interesting to see how it all works out. On the other hand, and it's all very interesting because there isn't an answer, right? That's the best thing. Um, but it does, you know, Zed does give you some background for each one of those things. Everything he's talking about, he gives you a background. But there's a lot of background and not that much to the book. The book, at least in this edition, this is, is um, 200 pages, it looks like. The previous edition was even shorter. Um, the the little orange one that I'd read previously. So um, I do recommend this book, but only if you have a reasonably good background in a lot of physics. So, um, you know, take that as it may, as it may, as take that as you may. I will put the newer edition, a link to the new edition in the um, notes below, as I normally do. All right. But thank you very much for listening, and I will get back to you next week with some other random book for my bookshelf. Bye now.